Hello, and welcome to the Mobile Accessible Games interview series. I'm your host, Aaron Spelker, and each week, Mobile Accessible Games does interviews with game developers or accessibility influencers about the state of accessible gaming. And this week, we are very excited to have James Black, who is the developer of Football Chairman Pro, one of my all-time favorite games. So I'm very excited to talk to him about the game and all of its components. So James, welcome to the interview series. Thank you for having me on. Now, James, you may not know, um, so with Mobile Accessible Games, uh, we review games, as you probably know, but you are one of only three games out of the hundred that have been reviewed that got a perfect A-plus score. So uh, you can tell uh, Football Chairman Pro is one of my all-time favorite games. Wow, I didn't realize that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you also uh, came in uh, second place. Uh, we vote every year about uh, best game of the year. and. Uh, uh, of the games that I review. So I reviewed 60 games last year uh, and you were tied for second uh, in that voting as well. So also another nice accomplishment for Football Chairman Pro. Wow, that is impressive, thank you. So James, I, I like to always kind of start off, you know, just tell us a little bit about, you know, who you are and uh, what got you into uh, creating games. Uh, yeah, basically, um, I've always been kind of into creating games since I was a kid. Basically my dad uh, worked in computing, so he, he sort of taught me some basic coding when I was young. We used to mess around playing playing games and then trying to make games uh, ourselves. And so it's something I always did as a kid. Um, and then basically about 20 years ago when um, I left university, I first started working myself and a friend of mine, Sean, we started playing around with Macromedia Flash and just basically um, made some basic games and animations in Flash. Um, we started our own little website, which um ended up getting sort of first of all tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands of hits oh, wow. um, just because in those days not a lot of people were doing kind of very simple you know web games basically um and that was back in the day when people could actually email flash files to each other and things could go viral like that so um so yeah we started a business basically based around these the sort of flash games that we were making um and effectively it was kind of viral marketing before Viral marketing was invented, really. Right, right. And we started working with quite a few interesting brands and clients here in the UK, people like the BBC and Sky TV, people like that. Because um, really, at the time, we were probably probably the, pretty much the only company in the UK that were making sort of flash animations and games at that point. Um, now, when you so were when you were in university, did you do computer programming, or is this just kind of you graduated university and started doing this on the side, and it kind of became something? Yeah. Basically, I actually did a degree in journalism, but okay. one of the one of the modules, because I was at university in the sort of mid to late 90s, that was when obviously the web was just starting to take right. off. And one of our modules at university was was web design. Um, so I kind of I really enjoyed that. And then when I left university, there was just obviously quite a lot of web jobs going rather than journalism jobs at that point in time. So um, I got into a web job. And that's as I say, I, that was when you know, we started messing around as a hobby. With one of my colleagues, Sean, just making making these flash games and animations, and when things started to take off, we both left that business and started our own business, basically. Yeah, I mean that's. Uh, I think we sounds like we went to college or university around the same time, kind of like early internet days. Like I started college uh, with email was not a thing. I finished college and email. You know, then you were starting to do email and. Um, you know, you started just at the end of, I think by senior year, you could start signing up for classes online as opposed to having to stand in line and, and do it in person. Um, so that that's kind of a, a really interesting time to kind of, you know, be at the cutting edge of really using that, uh, you know, I think kids today grow up and the internet is a pretty full-fledged, uh, you know, thing, um, very developed and mature. I mean, there it was the wild, wild west back then. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, my first day at university was the first time I'd ever used email. Yeah. Um, and then, as I say, it was by the time we left uni, uni, there was so many jobs going in the internet and it was just a kind of a bit of a free for all in those days. You didn't really, there wasn't anyone with any kind of qualifications really to do the sort of work. And because I was self-taught, um, you know, I managed to get a job relatively easily at that point. And then, as I say, we, you know, once we started playing with the games and the animations, um, we were lucky enough to be able to start our own business doing that. Um, although we didn't make a lot of money, but it was it was just we just spent um, spent our time having fun making, you say, making making viral games and animations for people. So, what's the next progress after you do flash games? What's the next next progression of what you you did? 
Yeah, so that, that went really well, but we didn't really make any money out of it. But we did get a lot of, like I say, interesting clients. Um, but then within a few years, quite a lot of big agencies had started getting into viral marketing. Obviously, we were still just a very small business with sort of three or four people in a, a very small office in Manchester. And um, and so things sort of moved on then to more into the social media side of things. And we started uh, looking at Facebook games, for instance. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we made a few Facebook games. But again, it was... We, we couldn't really find a way to monetize that. So we were still having to do kind of corporate websites and things like that in us as the main kind of main business just to keep the money flowing. But um, but as I say, our kind of hobbies and passions was always in our spare time, trying to come up with game ideas and animations and things like that. Um, and then obviously from social media, then things moved on to, to smartphones. And that's where obviously once the app stores launched, suddenly there was an opportunity to maybe commercialize some of the ideas that we had. But to be honest, even with football chairman, um, it didn't start off as an idea of can we make a commercial game or can we make some money out of it? It just started off as a game that we wanted to make as a hobby. Basically, it was a game that you know I'd wanted to play and I searched the app stores and no one else had made that particular game. And I just thought it'd be a good idea to make it as a hobby. Now, uh, uh, you know, I don't know what the latest numbers are, but I think I saw one stat that, uh, that you know, from a few years ago that Football Chairman Pro has been downloaded over two million times. I don't know if that number is higher even now. So I mean that that's a pretty big uh, success for a game on an on an app. You know, on, on, on yeah. In fairness, now it's it's gone past three million now. Although it's right. not, not just that's not just the pro version. That's all the versions, including the free versions as well. So that's the kind of because uh, I say unlike a lot of apps, we have we have sort of two apps in the app store. We've got a free app and we've got the pro version, which is the paid app. So. The sort of the three million figure covers both free and paid apps. Well, I I play the pro and it's well worth it. So for those out there, uh, <laughs> it's it's well w- worth spending the money to get the pro version. Quite quite fun. Um, so you're I assume uh, a a love of uh, uh, UK football or what we call soccer here in the United States. Um, a, a lover of that sport is why you kind of gravitated towards creating a game in that space. Yeah, basically, effectively, my probably the, the two things that I'm probably most passionate about are, are football and and making games. So effectively, it was you know combined my two favourite things in a way. So um, so yeah, it was something that even as a kid, like I say, when me and my dad were making making games, we were, tr- we were making basic football management games where it was just you know press a button and calculate the results and the league table and all you know really simple stuff like that. But it's it's something that I've always enjoyed doing. And are Manchester United fan or who's your team? No, my team's Preston North End. Um, Preston North End. Uh, well, I don't, that... We don't normally tell people that in case they think somehow that football chairman's biased towards Preston. <laughs> Could be. Uh, now, I don't recognize that name from the Premier League. Is that is that uh, championship? Team. Championship. Okay. See, so, yeah, and that's one thing that I find very fascinating. Is as, as, as I never really thought about it until I was playing football chairman pro that. There are so many teams uh, and so many passionate fans around those teams. Like there's, you know, you would not get that many teams. I mean, we have like, you know, let's say 30 baseball teams, uh, but we have three mil or 300 million, you know, people in the United States. I mean, you have that many teams and I don't know how many people are in the UK, but 30 million, 60 million. I don't know uh, how many people live in the United Kingdom. Yeah. I think it's about 60, 70 million. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a, that's quite a, and that's just a, the the Premier League, and then you know the Championship League. People are just as passionate about that. So you know, they add another you know twenty some odd teams there, and you know, all the way down. I mean, there are just so many teams. Um, you, you know, we don't get that. You, you have American, you know, the, the the main football. Let's just say, and then that's kind of really it. Uh, there's not you know a minor league, you know, and definitely not three minor leagues kind of that are actively really watched and supported in the way that you have it over there in the UK with uh, with the football that you guys watch. So I, I really found that kind of interesting, the passion and, and the, the fandom around it. And that's, that's to be fair, why the structure of football chairman works so well, because, you know, you really do have even the way all the way down to the tiny teams in the sort of seventh division, you still have a passionate fan base, even if it might only be a few hundred people, there's still, you know, those local teams still have, have their fans. And, and then even as you get up to say the fifth league, um, you know where Wrexham are at the moment. You've probably seen what's going on. Oh yeah, with yeah, that's uh, the one with um, Ryan Reynolds, right? And that the team he bought. 
you know, effectively they're doing a kind of real life football chairman with with Wrexham and right. trying to take them from the non-league all the way up to the top. And and basically that's for me what makes the kind of idea of football chairman as a game, you know, quite a, a compelling idea is that you could take, you really could take a team from the seventh league and build them all the way up to the top. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I did that. Uh, 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 the other interesting thing that I found, uh, I mean, uh, at the very least, you have the teams that you have uh, seem to be the real teams. I don't know about if you use real player names, but, you know, in the United States, everything is kind of like you would never be able to use the real team names without, you know, getting permissions and getting, you know, having to pay them big chunks of money to do that. Is that how it is in the UK or? No, in fairness, we um, if we've we've used geographical team names, so we haven't used, for instance, you know, Manchester United and things like that. We might use um, Man United, or they may be, you know, Liverpool. Oh, similar enough, yeah. Yeah, similar enough. You know, we've we're looking at we work with a good legal team in London who've made sure that we we've, we've stayed the right side of not infringing anyone's kind okay. of license or copyrights, and because a lot of people have said to us, why don't we have real players in the game? But actually, if you're starting the game in the seventh division, by the time you get up to the Premier League, it's going to be 20, 30 years in the future at least. Right, and so right. all, the, exactly. all the recognised players will have retired by then anyway. So right. exactly. there, was no, there was no real need for us to worry about using real players or real managers or anything like that. Right. And and again, the, the money that you'd have to pay out, I mean, they would own all of Football Chairman Pro, you would be making nothing. because no, well, Exactly. And, and in fairness, the other thing that helps us is that... Um, we always set out for most of the data to be user generated. So um, there's something like 10,000 data packs now there that have been created by the users that you can load into the game. So effectively, um, if somebody really gets hung up on wanting to select certain team names, they can create their own data pack with their own team names, um, which again is something that we've always been quite keen to kind of establish a community of people who, who you know, wanted to be creating their own data for the game. Now, I know you've gotten, you know, testimonials from, you know, professional football players and some like celebrities and stuff. Have you had an opportunity to interact with any of them uh, directly? Uh, only through Twitter. Um, it's always it's always fun when you see a real footballer playing football chairman or um, like you say, we've had a few minor celebrities and things like that playing it over the years. And so it's always every now and again, you might suddenly see a spike in interactions and wonder what's going on. And then you realize that somebody famous has mentioned that they're playing it or like you say, a famous footballer has been playing it or something like that. But yeah, we we tend to, you know, send them a quick message on Twitter. But uh, other than that, we've never had any real life interaction. Right. Now, so you, you've gone from 2 million when I saw a stat, you're up to 3 million. Now is, is the the downloads, you, you know, starting to taper off or are they pretty, you know, going strong or yeah. you know, mean, gaining fair, momentum? We've been really lucky that... Um, you know, we've been, it's nine years now since the very first version of the, the app launched. And actually, we've been fairly consistent in those nine years that we've managed to stay fairly high up in the downloads. There's certainly here in the UK, we've been one of the top selling kind of sports games for, for nine years now. Um, and actually, it's, it's this year has been one of our best years for quite a while because we just keep adding, for instance, we add new languages to the game. So as soon as we add a new language, like for instance, this year, we had a Turkish and well, that opened the new market uh, to us. I'd like to argue with you. I, I think it's because of my review of the game. <laughs> That's why, why you've had such <laughs> amazing success. <laughs> uh, so why don't you tell people, you know, again, well, I'm a player of games. I'm not a creator of games. I mean, explain to people a little bit like, you know, lift the curtain a little bit and like, how does football chairman pro come together? Is, is it, you know, a lot of, you know, data and mathematical calculations. It's basically what's behind the hood of that game or, you know, what, what kind of all brings it together? Yeah, effectively, I mean, the, the very first sort of stage was to try and create all the really kind of, like you say, boring data structures that create a real life football, effectively. So you've got, you know, obviously we've got about 150 teams in the in the kind of league structures. Each team, each league, in our game, each league has got 22 teams. Then each, each team's going to have 25, 30 players. Then every season you're going to have a fixture list. And after every fixture, you're going to have an updated league table. And it's, it's all those kind of boring data structures that kind of create the kind of background of the game, if you like. And that was the first bit that I built, the kind of just a really boring game that replicated all of those, you know, real life structures. And then once you've once you've kind of got that those structures in place, that's when you can do all the fun bits like buying and selling players and sacking your manager and updating your stadium and things like that. 
What about like in the, the game simulation part? Do you do you go and say, all right, well, I have, you know, these 11 players on the field. And if you add up all their stats, that gives you a score of, I'm just making something up, of a thousand. Uh, you add up the opponent, you know, they have a score of, of 1,200 and they're therefore the other team's going to have a more statistical chance of winning that game um, than the than the other one. Like, do you, do you aggregate the players or are you really kind of more yeah, granular or simulating things? Yeah, that's roughly it. As you, as you know, each player has a rating out of 99. Um, and so depending on which division you're in, most of the teams will fall within you know, a, a sort of 10 point bracket from where your team is roughly. So let's say I'm, you're in the bottom division, your team might have a rating of 30. The worst team in that division is probably going to be about 25. The best team is probably going to be about 35. So if your team rating, if your average player rating is about 30, then you're probably going to end up somewhere in the middle of the table. Um, and so for each individual match, it makes those kind of calculations, as you say, based on how strong your team is, how good your manager is, um, and how good the opposition and their manager is. But then you've got other things to take into account, like home teams tend to win you know, right. slightly more often. And, you know, if you turf, a, I imagine. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then things like, you know, if your players are, are lacking a bit of fitness, for instance, if you've had a big run of games and the players are starting to get tired, then, you know, that might be a factor. And so there's lots of, there's lots of very sort of nuanced calculations that go into it as well. Now, did all of those calculations, you know, you know, did you come up with all of those nine years ago or have you kind of like, you know, tweaked it over the years to make it more refined and more realistic and more, you know, complex, if you will? I'd say the basic structures and the basic calculations initially were worked on sort of nine years ago. And then the probably the first couple of years of the game, obviously, we took into account a lot of people's feedback in terms of just tweaking the game mechanisms and um, just trying to make things slightly more accurate and slightly more realistic. I think I think in terms of the match results, that's probably one of the biggest biggest ones is that, I don't know, you know, for, say for American sports, but in, in football over here, even though, you know, 99 times out of 100, if Manchester United played against Wrexham, Manchester United would probably win. There's still going to be that one or two times where maybe Wrexham might win or, you know, maybe right. five or six times where there might be a draw. And it's how, how do you throw those sort of, more random results in without annoying people because right. obviously if you've you've spent time building your club up and you've got all your players who are you know 99 rated players and then suddenly you're going to lose to a, a small team you're going to get annoyed by that but then that does happen in real life so we've got to kind of you know find the right balance with that and I think I think that's that's been a tricky one because um yeah, it's gotta things- it's gotta happen low enough or infrequently enough not to be annoying but enough to actually you know make it exciting you know so yeah, what, exactly. what is, is that three percent of the time is that two percent of the time you know what what is that percent that doesn't yeah, exactly. hurt people yeah. and it's it's particularly when you know there's some people who for instance once they get to the top of the premier league they they literally want their team to be winning every single week and they get annoyed right. if their team doesn't win every single game and it's like you know that isn't how it works in real life but you know that's how some people feel but we 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 think we've got the balance just about right in, in that side of things. Um, I, I, I did get an undefeated season, and I got a tro- I, yeah, I got it. I think that's an achievement too that popped. Yeah, that uh, is probably the most difficult achievement. So yeah. that's, that's pretty impressive. Uh, I played a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> I actually where, where I where I started the game, um, I downloaded a bunch of games because I was um, off to. Uh, go get my CNI dog. So I, I just went blind three years ago. I just got my dog about 18 months ago now. Um, and it was in the middle of COVID. So they said, you know, you can come down and train with the dog, but you have to quarantine in a hotel for two weeks where you literally can't leave the hotel room. We will deliver you your food and you are in this hotel room for two weeks. And I said, oh, all right, well, I'll just download a bunch of games and play them. And I figured I'd, I'll get through, you know, five or six games and build up a bunch of reviews, uh, you know, for uh, for when I come out of, uh, you know, training with the dog that I can post. And I just played Football Chairman Pro. It was the only game that I played for the, t- the two weeks for like eight hours a day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and the eight hours flew by. I didn't even realize, like, I'd look up and it'd be the, the afternoon. I was like, oh, my gosh, I've been playing this for, you know, six or eight hours, moving moving my team up. So I, I played a lot, a lot of uh, Football Chairman Pro, and I just fell in love with it. It was just such a such a great game. Um, and the thing that it really um, did for me 
is before I went blind three years ago, there is a very similar game um, called Out of the Park Baseball, which is a baseball game as opposed to a um, you know football game. And but it's very very similar. I mean, it, you know, again, buy and sell players, groom your players, train them, you know, hire you know fire coaches, um, you know, build up your stadium, sell your concessions, set ticket prices. I mean, all all of that. I mean, it is basically football chairman pro. Um, except for baseball. And when I first went blind, I said, oh, you know, I should be able to play that game. It's just a bunch of, you know, numbers and tables. I mean, it shouldn't be that hard. Um, that's probably an accessible game and it, it's completely not accessible. So I was really, really disappointed with that. And when I think that's why I just kind of really grabbed onto Football Chairman Pro because I mean, it's basically the exact same simulation sports experience, except, you know, just a different sport, but, you know, all the same kind of underlying content, you know, uh, you know, and, and kind of same gears underneath the hood, if you will. Yeah, I mean, we've had we've had quite a few people approach us over the years saying, "Why don't we make baseball, NFL, basketball, rugby, cricket?" Um, uh, in fact, apart from the fact we're a very small a small business and we haven't, you know, football chairman is keeping us more than busy enough anyway as it is. But even, even if we did want to do that, I think that one of the reasons for me that football chairman works is because I, you know, I am very passionate about football, whereas. I, you know, I don't know anything about baseball. And if I tried to make a baseball game, it would probably be absolutely terrible. You know, we would need to find a real baseball expert who who knew enough about all the structures and the underlying finances and all that side of things to, to help us make the game, basically. Yeah, I mean, I think you could almost hire a consultant. I mean, you have so much of the infrastructure really right there. It's just kind of tweaking the formulas, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, you know, uh, I think you have a lot of, a lot of it. Uh, that you can leverage off the football chairman pro i would love it if you played you know, if you guys created a uh a baseball game and obviously you have you know 300 million people in the united states alone who uh you know watch watch baseball or are available to watch baseball or play baseball so uh, you know yeah it's definitely like i say it's definitely something we thought about and like i said we have had quite a few people over the years asking us for various different sports and it's always something we'd love to do one day in the future when when football if football chairman ever comes out of it and we get a bit of time basically now, uh, so explain that to people. So I think a lot of people think, you know, oh, okay, well, nine years ago, you created a game. I mean, what have you been doing since then? Uh, you know, so uh, explain to people what it takes to really kind of maintain a game like Football Chairman Pro that, you know, really fills up all your time. Yeah, I mean, basically, this is the thing. It's unfortunately for a lot of the people using it, um, the thing that fills out time is all the boring stuff, like making sure it just works with every time there's an operating system update, whether that's Apple or Android, making right. every time a new handset comes out, making sure it works with the latest screen resolutions and the latest handsets and devices, you know? And so once you kind of add in all the different operating system combinations, all the different combinations of tablets, phones, devices out there and keeping, making sure it runs smoothly on all of that is, is a big job in itself. Then on top of that, you know, you've got the actual kind of servers and the databases and all, all, this, all the actual, you know, mechanisms that go into to making sure that people can play the game and it doesn't crash on them and all that side of things. And, and just all that kind of boring background stuff, you know, takes up so much time that when you are a small business, you know, effectively I'm the only person working full, full time on football chairman. So, you know, just, just all of that stuff alone, you know, takes up most of my days. Um, is that, is that, um, is that frustrating in a way and that you know you created this game and but you, you kind of never get to put it down because you have to constantly maintain it which then doesn't allow you to you know maybe be creative in a different way and create that baseball game or that cricket game because you know your day is filled up just you know managing you know bug breaks because of an ios update um, I mean, obviously, when things like that happen, it is frustrating. Like, as you say, you know, a new version of iOS comes out, and we end up having to recode a load of stuff and things like that. That side of things is frustrating because really we would love to be spending our time building a, a baseball game or even just a new version of Football Chairman Pro. Um, but at the same time, you know, I can't really complain because I'm spending my life doing something that I love doing. So, you know, it's not not exactly a bad life. Well, does it ever make sense to say? I'm going to sunset football chairman pro and you know now you know you want the next version you know I've, I've supported this for 10 years you know now I'm going to football chairman pro 2 and you know go buy that game if you want you know what's going to be maintained for the next 10 years I mean it's definitely it's something we've been looking to do for a while it's 
the, the issue, which is a good thing for us, is that, as, as I say, the existing version of football chairman is still as popular ever, as ever. So, right. uh, number one, you know, it's still, we're still finding new users all over the world and it's still, people still seem to love the existing game. And number two, because it's so, so popular, it's keeping us very busy and we don't have the time to start on that second one. You know, I think I'd always imagined that by this point, as you say, football chairman would almost have automatically sunsetted itself and start to taper off. And right. when that happened, that would be the time to start building the next one. But, you know, we've still got, we've got a lot of big plans for a new version. It's just getting the time and, and you know, making that leap, basically. I can imagine to me on a game like like this, like Football Chairman Pro, that it it's I mean the the difficult part is probably you know the mathematical formula and the balance of the game. You know, you add in a mechanic. You know, let's just say you oh I have players and it's okay. Uh, you know, these player ratings and the average rating and you know whoever has a higher rating, average rating of players has a more likely chance to win. But now I'm going to have to factor in. The coaches and how does that change it and now it's the turf field and i have to put in that component and now it's the home field advantage and i have to put in that part and to keep that mathematical you know develop that mathematical formula and keep it balanced and tight enough and close enough to you know simulate games in a way that it doesn't just break the game i imagine you know that's probably what takes the most to try to get right to get a good feel of the game yeah, definitely. And, and the thing that actually makes it even harder, and this is probably the most difficult bit, is the fact that people's individual phones and tablets, each individual phone and tablet will also have its own kind of random seed, if you like, that, that can vary quite drastically from one type of phone to a different type of phone. So one person, what, what we always tried to do with Football Channel was create a universe that kind of could you know, be a, a unique universe that device. You know, some people say, oh, you know, football chairman scripted and that we, we, you know, we've deliberately coded it so you only win the Champions League now and again, or we, you know, mm -hmm. there's nothing scripted at all about it. It's your device creates this kind of random universe with all the other teams in it. And, and as obviously, if you play it for a thousand years, all that, all the teams will have changed and evolved. And, and so the experience that one person might have on one particular device actually can be quite different to the universe that somebody else's device might create. Um, and that kind of adds in a whole load of random stuff that we can't even really control ourselves or we could control it. But as I say, we've always wanted to make sure that the game wasn't in any way scripted and that, you know, if if random things happen on somebody's device, that's just the kind of the way that that particular universe is, if you like. Now you were talking about servers, too. So like when I play Football Chairman Pro, is everything you know, is the game all contained within my phone or is it really kind of going out and grabbing? you know, data or information or whatever from, you know, a server that's out there and storing my data on out on that server. Like how's, how's that interaction work? No, it's hundred percent. The game data is hundred percent on your phone. I'd say your phone is the one that's making all the calculations. Okay. Um, as I say, your, the database is all stored on your phone locally. And we always, we set out to do it like that initially, because one of the, one of the big things that people have enjoyed in football chat is being able to play it offline. You right. know, a lot of games, particularly when we first launched, a lot of games were very much, you know, online kind of multiplayer football management games, which involved obviously in those days using up a lot of people's data. Um, and we found that people like being able to play football chairman at school or on the plane or on the beach or somewhere where they might not have, have any data. Right. Um, and so, so it's all self-contained, but at the same time, we do allow people to save their game to the servers um, just in case, you know, they drop the phone down the toilet or something like that. Right. Right. Yeah, so it's so, that's just kind of a, a, a screenshot of where you are at that point in time. It's not constantly yeah, yeah. Uh, banging against it. And, yeah, you, and you have like three saves or whatever. So like, yeah. I, and again, I don't understand anything because I'm just a player of games. Like, is that server like really just a laptop somewhere or do you like where? No, where it's, is... quite, it's obviously we've got, you know, now there's probably millions and millions of save games on there. So it's quite a big server. Um, yeah. Do you but, like pay some company to hold that or something? Like, yeah, we've, we've got it. We've got it stored with, uh, yeah, in a quite, a, you know, it's quite an expensive piece of kit. But it's, um, as I say, it doesn't it doesn't do any actual processing. It's just literally sort of transactions of loading and saving games. All right. And is that something like again? Do you, do you guys have that like sitting in your house, or is that like again you pay some company and they have it on some warehouse with everybody else? Yeah, we've got a, we've got a company that's got a dedicated server sitting there for us. Um, so, you know, the, 
one of the great things about Football Chairman Pro for me is, you know, I'm a fully blind person and there, here is a game, lots of information, a lot of content, 100% accessible, every button's labeled, every, you know, interaction and swipe works flawlessly in that game. Very, very smooth experience for a blind person such as myself. So, you know, how did that come about? Is, is that, you know, some of it just kind of natural by whatever platform you were using to create the game or did you have to take some real, you know, uh, concerted effort to make the game accessible for those who are visually impaired? No, I mean, to be honest, it started out kind of, you know, as a happy accident in a way that I, when we built the first version of the game, I honestly, I just assumed that all games would be accessible with voiceover. I didn't, I genuinely didn't realize how few games actually are fully accessible. Um, and so when Football Chairman launched and it was accessible with voiceover, I just assumed that was, that was the norm. Um, and then, then, you know, we started to get more, more blind and visually impaired users contacting us saying how they're enjoying the game. But they, in the early days, they were pointing out maybe bits that we'd miss where we maybe missed a button or two or some right. bits of the game that weren't working perfectly. So we tried our best to work with, with our kind of visually impaired users just to tweak any bits of the game that needed tweaking. And, and there's been some bits that we haven't been able to fully get working the way that we'd like to just because of the way that voiceover itself works. Um, but, but generally we're pleased that, you know, we've managed to kind of make it as accessible as we could. And then you have the same sort of thing on with TalkBack, right? For for those Android users. I mean, does does kind of the accessibility you do for one work for the other, or do you have to do you know separate accessibility actions? No, it seems to. That's the good thing is that it seems to work because we'd always set out to make make the kind of code as cross platform as possible. That works with both both platforms as well in terms of the visually impaired accessible stuff. So, so yeah, we've been quite lucky in that respect. And what, what platform do you use to create the game? Like do you use Unity or what do you use to make that game? Uh, no, it's a combination of all kinds of things. I mean, a lot of it was just, I mean, I'm a self-taught coder. So a lot of it is just kind of my own sort of self-taught code that I then packaged up with various different packages. You know, in the early days we used things like Cordova to uh, make a cross, cross platform, you know, package for the game. Um, these days we work with things like um, Capacitor and um, various other sort of cross-platform development uh, sort of plugins and things like that to make make sure it works across Android and iOS because you know we didn't really have the manpower to be kind of monitoring two separate code bases basically. Um, so I think you said kind of right now you're the sole person kind of maintaining football chairman pro but like how many how many people were involved in creating the game you know over over those nine years well initially again initially it was just me because it was my character it was just a game that i built as a hobby basically um that's to say it was a game that i had it was an idea that i had a game that i wanted to play myself and i when i looked in the app store and no one else had made it i thought i'd try and make it but it was genuinely just intended to be a bit of a hobby um the very first version um went in the app store and went kind of really viral we got to we got to kind of number three in the uk app star store charts within a week of well two weeks of launching and that was without spending any money on promotion or doing yeah anything. i was going to say how did you do that is that that was just luck well, of the draw if you will well we do again we do have a back, background in viral marketing so we, we do understand the way that the kind of viral mechanisms work and we you know um basically what had happened was when i when i kind of created the, the sort of demo version of the game that i thought was almost good enough to launch that was when i kind of showed it to Sean, who's the co-founder of Underground Creative. He, he then, you know, worked on it with me to get it ready for launching the app stores. Um, and as I say, between me and Sean, with our kind of background in viral marketing, we, we had a few, a few tricks up our sleeve to try and get it out there, but um, we, weren't there. we didn't realize how well it was going to do. And then, like I say, within you know, two or three weeks, it was right up in the top of the charts. That's great. Yeah, I mean, and probably nine years ago, you have the advantage of there's fewer games as well. I mean, like, I forget the status of like 2000 games a day get released on the app store. So I mean, how do you how do you get heard through that noise? So hopefully nine years ago, you weren't you didn't have as many competitors being launched that week. You know what I mean? No, exactly. I mean, we it was just a case of being in the right place at the right time. Basically, I think if we try to do it now, there's no way, like as you say, there's no way we'd be able to compete with all the other apps that are out there and all the other launches that are going on. Because Obviously, there's agencies out there now spending, you know, huge amounts of money to launch apps, whereas, you know, we did it all without spending a penny. Well, I mean, now you have different uh, advantages, right? Because now you have, you know, the makers of Football Chairman Pro that's been downloaded 3 million, 
you know, times in, you know, hundreds of countries or something like that, you know, you could leverage that for if you put out a baseball game or a cricket game. Yeah. I mean, I, the only downside for that is that obviously, I, you know, I, we've got, you know, half a million followers on social media, but they are all very much football fans. There may be some crossover with other sports. I'm sure if we did launch another sport game, we'd, there'd be a bit of crossover. But I, I still think we were, you know, nine years ago, the market was obviously a lot easier than it would be today. What? So speaking of that, that's a, a good point. Uh, so like, in the United States, let's just say you made a baseball game. If you then made a football game, well, lots of people who watch baseball also watch football. You know, that's very common here in the United States. Uh, when people are, and that's American football I'm talking about, um, if people are watching or, you know, playing football chairman pro, what is another sport that a lot of people who enjoy football, uh, you know, they also, I mean, is it cricket? Is it rugby? Is it? You know, yeah, in, in the UK, it'd probably be cricket and rugby. Um, the only thing with cricket and rugby is they don't have a sort of their professional structures, if you like, don't go quite as deep as, as football. Um, as like we were talking about at the start, about how you know, even down to the seventh league in, in English football, you know, there's there's still you know, passionate fans and, and local teams. And you know, once you get down, you know, a few divisions down in rugby and, and cricket, those those kind of professional structures if you like don't exist as much it's a lot much more grassroots sports um right. and so we you know we definitely rugby rugby is probably the most similar and if we were going to make another kind of uk type sport i suppose rugby would be the easiest one to do because it is it's very similar but there's just not the same you know financial structures in place so the sort of you know the wages and the crowds and the money and things like that would would need a lot of tweaking right maybe be on a smaller scale but you know, I don't know. I think if you were, whether you're doing sales of a player for $30 million or $3,000, it's still the excitement of just upgrading your person. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and, and say we've had, we've had a lot of rugby fans and cricket fans over the years coming to us asking that. And it's, they, you know, they are two sports that I am, you know, I am keen on. And, you know, it would be interesting to do that and see how it works. So when you, you know, we were talking a little bit before about accessibility, it kind of, mostly worked and you, you did some tweaks was there any part of accessibility that was um difficult to implement that you really struggled with getting in your game or since it's kind of uh you know all you know you know tables of information it, it, it was pretty simple i'd say that the most difficult thing is just that obviously i've not really got personally any any particular use uh you know background in using voiceover or any any screen readers so i for me to test the game myself was was difficult because I felt like the way that I was using voiceover probably wasn't the way that an actual visually impaired person might use it. And so um and you know we needed other people. So even if I'm just making one small tweak on a button, I still need to send that out to a few people for them to test it and, and feedback. So it's quite a could be quite a laborious process to fix those little things that needed fixing. But once that was done it, it seemed to work okay. And you know, do you um have any kind of words of wisdom for you know we were kind of saying before how there's so few games that do have accessibility uh you know was there any kind of comment that you can give or advice you can give for a developer who you know is working on a game and you know what they can do or think about when uh, they're incorporating accessibility into their game yeah i'd just say that our experience was that as i said initially we were we were lucky that we had a game that basically pretty much did work with with screen readers and voiceover in the first place but um, but for us, just from a kind of point of view, the sort of feedback we get is just, I'd say the, the feedback we get from the kind of visually impaired community and our users out there is, it's probably, the, they're probably one of our most enthusiastic and, you know, passionate user kind of segments out there. And it's, it's really, you know, exciting for us as a very small development team to get that sort of feedback from, from people in the blind and visually impaired community. And it means a lot to us that they're enjoying it. And so I'd say if, you know, if you can make an accessible game, it's it's certainly a very you know rewarding, you know, way of, of doing things. Yeah, I mean that's it, it is a very passionate group because again, we only get a, a small sliver of games that are even potentially accessible to us, right? You know, so thousands of games come out a day, and you know maybe a couple dozen may might have some sort of accessibility, and then most of those don't have great accessibility or partial accessibility or there's something broken about it. So you get a game like Football Chairman Pro that is fully accessible 
um, and then a rich and deep game. I mean, that's that's a unicorn. You know, that's very rare. I mean, that's why there's only three A plus games that have gotten the A plus rating in the hundred games I've reviewed so far. Uh, football chairman uh, being one of them. It's it's just because it, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist a game that is really uh, a deep enriching game that you know all parts of it are fully accessible, making it for a great game playing experience. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think again one of the reasons we were looking with football chairman is because it was. You know, it was just a kind of started as a hobby game for us. We had no, you know, targets to meet. We didn't need to make any money out of it. We didn't need to you know, hit a certain number of downloads. We had no bosses telling us what to do or, you know, financial people breathing down our necks telling us we needed to, you know, sell more copies. It was just simply we wanted to make a game that people enjoyed. And to us, it doesn't matter whether, you know, it's a visually impaired person who's playing it or anyone else. It's, you know, we want them to enjoy it just the same. And so that was our, our target was to make an enjoyable game, not to make lots of money. And I think that's why we were able to spend the time making sure that it, it was as accessible as possible. That's a, and another thing of one of my just personal frustrations is um, when you look at uh, baseball in America, it is one of the few games that is really fully accessible for a blind person because you can really it's a you know it's kind of a slow paced game and that they can describe you everything that happens you know the commentators can describe everything that happens that you can really envision what's happening in that game where you you can sort of you know loosely understand what's happening in a soccer game if someone's kind of explain someone's dribbling down the sideline and making a pass across the field but it's it's more abstract than baseball where you can really you know, understand it to the, the this almost the same detail level of what what is occurring. So that's why I, I get a little frustrated that there's not an accessible baseball game for the blind because that's like the one sport that we is easiest for us to understand and play and have a connection with. You know, a lot of blind people love baseball for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, again, that that's my pitch for you guys doing a baseball game. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. You know, you said you you know you're putting this out at first as just kind of a hobby you know game. You didn't really need to make money on it, um, or that really wasn't the main goal. But you know, how do you think about monetization? I mean, there's there's many different ways to kind of monetize a game, whether that's you know letting advertisers spin your game or doing microtransactions or just here's a one time fee or you know here play the game for free for you know, a little bit of period of time, but if you want to get past season five, you know, now you, now you buy the full thing. I mean, how did you determine what was the right structure for what you were creating with football chairman pro? I mean, to be honest, we, because we, again, we didn't set out to make money out of it. Really. We, we just tried a few different things to see what would work. Um, and the one thing that we felt has always worked really well for us, like, as I mentioned earlier, is having a free version of the game and a paid version of the game, because we always felt like, we, we definitely wanted to have a free version because we appreciate that there's people, you know, around the world who, who you know, even though in the UK, 2.99 to download an app doesn't seem like a lot of money at the same time, you know, there's people even in the UK that might be quite a bit of money. We don't, we, we still want people to be able to enjoy the game and play the game, even if, even if they don't want to pay to download an app. Um, so, but at the same time, we, you know, we do need to make money because we want to make a living out of this. So the way that we felt worked best was to have a free app that, had you know a slight a few slight limitations in terms of you know you only get 30 seasons and then you have to you know retire as chairman and start again um but we felt that after 30 seasons if people people you know by that point should know if if they love the game or not and hopefully if they would love it enough to pay a small amount of money to pay for an even bigger and better version um so that model of having a free and paid app has worked well for us in that respect um and then it, within the game there are some microtransactions you could choose to pay for more money for your club or a bigger stadium or um, you could watch rewarded videos again to get more money for your club and things like that but all of those are completely optional um, you know really you're supposed to play the game without ever needing to purchase any extra extra money because really you're supposed to try and figure out how to make money yourself that's the kind of business side of the game you know what actually uh, I thought was really the smoothest version of I saw that uh you guys had the, you know, oh, you won the championship league, you know, click this button and uh, post it to your Facebook page or post it to your Twitter page and you get some extra money if you if you do that. Um, that was kind of the easy, I mean, literally just press the button and it was posted to my, my, my Twitter page. I mean, it really worked pretty flawlessly and also a great, obviously, viral marketing because then 
you know, you're posting out to everyone, you know, that you're playing this game and maybe they check out that game. So, I mean, that's a, a great way for your standpoint of, you know, marketing the game and getting the word out constantly about, uh, you know, that football chairman exists. Yeah. And to us, I say as a small business with no kind of like marketing or, you know, advertising budget, spreading the word is more important than somebody paying us, you know, a small amount of money for a microtransaction. You know, we, we were more keen to grow the user base rather than trying to squeeze squeeze money out of people. You know, there's, there's quite a few similar games to ours out there that are, you can see that they've been built deliberately to try and squeeze every penny out of people and that, you, right. you know, you can't, you can't progress past a certain place without spending some money on a, an app purchase. But we've always set out to make sure that, you know, if you want to, our game is completely playable without any of that purchases or without having to watch an advert or anything like that. Now, I, I mean, obviously being downloaded 3 million times, uh, Football Chairman Pro is a success in any way that you slice it. But when you think about Football Chairman Pro, what makes you feel like it's successful? Is it is it that it's been downloaded 3 million times? Is it that it's been downloaded in, you know, 150 countries? Or you know, like, what is it that, you, you know, really gives you pride about, you know, the, that this game that you put up? Um, I think for me, it's the fact that people people still seem to really love it. It's people, you know, there's people who have been literally playing it nonstop for nine years. And, you know, that's, it's, you know, say it's not about, you know, the number of downloads. It's the fact that the people who download it seem to have really enjoyed it. It's, you know, we've, we've always had good ratings on the app stores, but then, you know, it's the, when you see people posting things on social media that, as I say, they've been playing to the year, I think it was one guy played up to about the year 15,000 or something ridiculous. And, you know, wait, those he, wait he's, he's in the year 15,000. Is that what you just said? Yeah. So That's... it's things like that that make you realize, you know, if somebody must have spent, you know, literally years of their life playing football chair. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you have stats on him? Like, has he won, you know, 5,000 times or something? Like, yeah, he, he's, um, he certainly tops most of the high school charts in terms of things like, you know, yeah, the most games won, the most trophies won, things like that. Uh, you need to get some like event where the top 10 players of uh, Football Chairman Pro somehow compete against each other. That would be interesting. Yeah, we did. We so, have thought about trying to do something like that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, you know, kind of any advice, I mean, you, you do a great thing for the blind people. You were kind of talking about having a free version and then a paid version, which that works out great for blind people because the worst thing is when you buy a game and then find out it's not accessible in some way or or, or there's a accessible breaking bug in the game and you don't really get to complete it. So having a free version makes uh, Football Chairman Pro where the blind community can really access that game, see if they like it, as you said, play 30 years and then, you know, pay for it, uh, which is as well well worth but um you know what would you say is advice for the blind community of how we can encourage developers and or more developers to create accessible games how how can we make our voices heard um to the develop game developing community yeah i think that, that is a tricky one but i think just do the sort of thing that you're doing by you know, as I said earlier, the, the people we've had in the blind community who've been playing the game are very passionate about it and they do spread the word within the community. And I think as a developer, I think it's, a, as I said, perhaps other developers don't realize how, you know, what a, what, what a passionate market that is. And that, as I say, if it doesn't actually, you know, for a lot of games, it probably wouldn't take very much work at all just to add that extra bit of accessibility on top. And it is well worth doing. So we, we kind of talked to you mentioned a couple things that you might have coming up. I mean, what is the definitive, you know, or maybe like the three-year plan with Football Chairman Pro or, or with your, you know, development studio? Is it, you know, making tweaks or updates to Football Chairman Pro? Is, you know, in three years, you want to be starting that next game? What, what's kind of on the horizon for uh, the work that you're doing? Yeah, definitely. It's important in the next three years. We, you know, we know there's a lot of people who, as I said before, even though there's people who've been playing football chairman nonstop for nine years, at the same time, they're probably getting a bit bored now. We appreciate <laughs> that, you know, they, we have got a kind of dedicated user base that would probably love to see a new version of the game out there. And, you know, a lot of our competitive games, you know, a lot of the compete, competing games with us, they tend to bring out a small incremental update every year and expect people to play once a year, you know, and pay more money every single year just for a fairly incremental update. Whereas with us, we wanted to, we wanted to give the game a real kind of shelf life so that people felt like if they spent their money on it, they would get, you know, 
they'd get their money's worth, but at the same time. Oh, I mean, yeah, think about that, two ninety nine for nine years of playing. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's a pretty good return on your investment. Exactly. So I think now, you know, I would absolutely love to be able to bring out a, a new version. And the other thing is obviously in the last, you know, over the years, we were quite limited in the early days with what we could do in terms of the power of what, you know, processing power of phones and things like that. You know, we, we, we tested the first version on really, really kind of very, very basic devices to make sure it would work. Whereas now, you know, obviously devices are so much more powerful. There's, there's a lot more we could do in the game. And, but at the and same more, time- And more storage room, right? I mean- Yeah, exactly. But at the same time, we also need to keep the simplicity because what people like is the fact that they can whiz through a season in about 15 minutes. And if you just sat on the bus for, for 20 minutes in the morning, you can, you know, you can whiz through a season without having to, you know, dedicate a you know, month of your life just to one season. Right. So we, we just need to get that right balance between a game that's got more depth and more, more features, but at the same time keeps the things that people love about the current game. Well, James, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. Uh, again, for those listening, Football Chairman Pro is one of my all-time favorite games. Got an A-plus rating of the 100 games that I've reviewed so far. So, uh, you know, really well worth it. Um, I was a person who in, enjoyed football uh, before, but uh, really fell in love with it uh, playing this game. So really appreciate you, uh, you know, creating a game that was accessible and, and, you know, that I got to spend a lot of time with and enjoy. No, well, thanks for that, because, um, yeah, it means a lot to us to have, you know, that sort of feedback. So thank you. Um, and all everybody, uh, I suggest you go out, uh, at least try the free version. And uh, I think if you play the free version, you'll end up buying the pro version because so, it's a great game. So go check out Football Chairman Pro out on the App Store uh, for Apple and also on the uh, Android Store as well. And James, thank you very much for coming out and being part of the interview series. No problem. Thanks for inviting me.